Good afternoon. It's a huge pleasure to be back here in Budapest, a city that means a lot to me, but I speak with one laughing and one weeping eye, as Shakespeare has it, laughing with the memory of being here on the 16th of June, 1989, that great moment which Adam Michnik just evoked. We were here together, but weeping because of the condition of Hungary today because of what is being done with that history. I was actually in this very building, Pierre, you will remember, in 1996 for a conference on the 40th anniversary of 1956, organized by the Institute for the History of the 1956 Revolution, and we all know what is now being done to the Institute of the 1956 revolution, as also to CEU and other institutions. Uh, and that makes my right eye weep. Um, I recall a remark that Apad Gönz made to me the day after the 16th of June, 1989, when he said, Timothy, you know, uh, I'm very glad to have lived to see the end of the last disaster but I hope I die before the beginning of the next one. <laughs> and um, he just about managed it. I'm going to speak really in three parts. First of all, as a witness in 1989, then as a historian talking about the impact on the West, because that's what we were, I was invited to talk about, and then as a political analyst talking about today, because I can't talk about 1989 impartially and objectively any more than Adam can, because I was very much a spectator engagé, and in a sense, particularly through my writings in the New York Review of Books, I was in some sense, in a modest way, a participant, at least in telling the story of what was happening in Central Europe to the West. Um, so let me start with my notebook, from 1989, which I went back to, to reread on this occasion. As many of you will know, I had been chronicling developments in Central Europe for about 10 years, since 1979, writing particularly about the democratic opposition, the efforts of emancipation, the Solidarność movement in Poland, and so on. The last time I'd been in Budapest was in spring 1988, when I visited Plot 301, which was then still covered in rubbish. It was a complete ruin. There was no memorial of any kind. What there was, however, was the great demonstration on Hero Square about the treatment of the Hungarians in Romania. Death to Nero was a slogan chanted. Now, I want to put 16th of June 1989 in context. So I came here in this, this notebook, begins on the 4th of June 1989 in Poland. I know the 4th of June has another connotation in Hungary, but in Poland it was the day of the first semi-free election in the Soviet bloc for 40 years and was effectively the end of communism in Poland. It was a great moment. I came on, and this is perhaps less remembered, via Bonn. Anyone remember Bonn? Used to be the capital of the Federal Republic of Germany where Gorbachev had visited. So between the 4th of June in Warsaw and the 16th of June in Budapest, let's remember there was Gorbachev in Bonn who was celebrated with an extraordinary outpouring of, of popular enthusiasm. It was called Ein Gorbasmus, a Gorbasm. And he was fated like a hero, wooed by West Germany with immense promises of economic cooperation, of largesse. And that's an important background. And then I came from Bonn to Budapest, um, where it's important to say my notebook carried already some warning notes from friends here. Warning notes in the direction that Pierre Kender already referred to about the way in which the regime, the party state, Pozgoy and others had tried to take over the event and use it for their own purposes. One historian friend even described it to me rather 
purely as a masquerade, comparing it to the ceremonial reburial of Lajos Kossuth in 1894 by a regime he hated. Nonetheless, on the day, like Adam Michnik, I was profoundly moved because it was a victory of historical justice. It was a victory for historical truth, which is something inimical to a uh, communist regime. It was, to use one of my favorite book titles, the title of a book by Miklos Molnar about 1956, The Victory of a Defeat. The Victory of a Defeat. This was the victory of a defeat. Um, and it was, of course, also actually the burial of Janos Kada, the political burial of Janos Kada. I compared him at the time to Shakespeare's Macbeth, seeing Banquo's ghost rising at the banquet, and Banquo's ghost for him was the ghost of Imer Nodge. And we then went on to plot 301. Adam, you will remember, we went together in a bus, and of course plot 301 had been completely restored. It looked very different. It was a place of celebration. I too, of course, remember vividly Victor Orban's terrific speech. The historian has to say it was a terrific speech. At the time, we saw it as part of an unfolding, unfolding chain of events, which I called at the time revolution, revolution with an F, a unique combination of reform and revolution, a new style of peaceful, nonviolent, self-limiting, negotiated revolution. I went on from here, from this moment of celebration, to East Berlin, where my small group of dissident friends in East Berlin were still in deep gloom and said, well, it may happen in Poland, it may happen in Hungary, but it couldn't possibly happen here, not in East Germany. It'll be another 30, 40 years before the Berlin Wall comes down how wrong they were. They still could not imagine. But I remember vividly talking to the teenage son of my best friend in East Germany, who was a Protestant clergyman, so Joachim wasn't able to study at university because he was the son of a Protestant clergyman. And he said, listen, I'm completely fed up with East Germany. Nothing is going to happen here. It's never going to change. DDR stands for Die Du Verreste, the stupid Remainers, those who stay. I'm getting out. And of course, you'll know how he got out, through Hungary. So he came to Hungary, and from Hungary, he went across the frontier to Austria, still not believing that East Germany would change. And of course, that's the next stage in the causal chain is the direct impact of what happened in Hungary on events in Germany. So that by the end of the year, after the fall of the Berlin Wall, after the Velvet Revolution in Czechoslovakia, after the fall of Ceausescu and Zhivkov, we could say, and I think we could only say it confidently at the end of the year, Yes, the 4th of June 1989 was the end of communism in Poland. Yes, the 16th of June 1989 was the end of communism in Hungary. But we said it slightly in retrospect when we knew that we got there. And at this point, since everyone is quoting poetry, let me quote to you a great poem by Seamus Heaney, the Irish poet. I quote, history says... Don't hope on this side of the grave. But then, once in a lifetime, the longed-for tidal wave of justice can rise up. And hope and history rhyme. And this was that once-in-a-lifetime moment when hope and history rhymed. When I speak about historical truth, it's important to say that I am not talking about replacing one historical mythology with another, an alternative mythology, a simplified and simplistic version of history. You will remember that Ernest Renan, 
the great French historian in his essay, Qu'est-ce que nation, famously said that a nation is a community of shared memory and shared forgetting, and therefore he said, historians are a danger to the life of the nation, because their job is to question and subvert the myth by which nations live, right? So we're not talking here about simply supplanting one simplistic national mythology with another. We're talking about establishing historical truth in all its complexity, and the truth around the story of Imre Nodj is a complex one. I pass now to the second part of what I wanted to say, which is about the history, what, what our chairman asked me to speak about, of the impact and perception in the West. So I've already started talking about that because the way I have told the story, the way I told the story at the time in a series of essays in the New York Review of Books and subsequently in a book, was in a way the dominant narrative, certainly in the English-speaking world, but broadly speaking in the West. But let me start by asking what we mean by the West, because it's not self-evident. It's not simple. Um, the West, of course, has played an enormous part in the historical imagination of Central and Eastern Europe, in, in, in the historical imagination. Uh, I remember the very first time I came to Hungary in 1979, I wrote down, I was 24 years old, I wrote down in my, my uh, notebook, Ah, Nugat, the Hungarian word for the West, because I wanted, it just came cropping up and I wanted to understand what it meant. Now, if we mean by the West, a community of shared values, culture, history, tradition, literature, then of course the West has existed for centuries, if not millennia, and continues to exist today. But the West, when we talked about it at that time, meant something more than that. It meant a real geopolitical actor. A geopolitical actor that fundamentally consisted of North America and Western Europe. The United States and Canada and the countries of Western Europe, particularly West Germany, France and Britain, but also others, joined in the European community and NATO. And if we're thinking about the relationship to the West, the first thing to say uh, is that this West of the Cold War, held together by the competition with the Soviet Union, and the Soviet bloc, had itself had a major impact on evolution in this part of the world, in Central and Eastern Europe, in the 1970s and 1980s. What Konrad Adenauer foresaw, Magnet Europa, Europe as a magnet, was by the 1980s exerting a powerful magnetism in this part of the world. Uh, a Western Europe that was prosperous, free, democratic, open, very attractive. When one spoke to people in Hungary or Poland or Czechoslovakia or Romania at that time and said, what do you want Hungary to be? The most frequent reply would be, I want it to be a normal country, right? A normal country. And then one asks, so what do you mean by normal? Right? Because in itself that means nothing. What is this normal? And one might get articles, answers which used Aristotle and Tocqueville and John Stuart Mill, but actually the answer was something like West Germany. <laughs> that was basically the basic model of a Norman country, including in Poland, by the way. It was basically we want to be like West Germany, not only attractive, free, open, rich, but also a democracy built on the foundations of a dictatorship. I like to argue that, counterintuitively, 1992 was a cause of 1989. What do I mean by that? I mean that, remember, the European community had set itself an ambitious target of completing the single market by 1992. And it seemed also to the reform-minded communist rulers in Hungary to be the future. It was going places. Hungary's economic future was going to depend on it also very directly. 
Let's not forget that Helmut Kohl had organized a billion Deutschmark credit for Hungary in 1987, and in a letter that he wrote to George H.W. Bush on the 28th of June 1989, so just after this event, he said, by the way, George, um, let, let, me, let me let you know that we're going to arrange another one billion Deutschmark credit for Hungary because we think it would be very useful for us. So there was also quite a hard edge to the economic power of the West. So the West in itself is a contributing cause to what happens in this part of the world. But let's now turn it the other way around and look at the impact on the West. So what happened in Poland and then here had by far the biggest impact on American policy, specifically American policy, and specifically the policy of the administration of George H.W. Bush, George Bush Sr. The Bush administration came into office in January 1989, and they made a complete reassessment of, uh, uh, of, of US foreign policy in relation to the Soviet bloc. And Robert Hutchings, who was an official in that administration, though also a scholar of Eastern Europe, says the two biggest factors in that reassessment were, number one, Gorbachev's commitments on nuclear disarmament at the heart of the Cold War, and number two, the roundtable talks in Poland, which concluded in mid-April 1989. And that was a really important signal, and what is new in American policy at this point, is that Eastern Europe, as they called it, becomes center stage. Instead of being a policy focused overwhelmingly on the Soviet Union and only secondarily on Eastern Europe, Eastern Europe becomes center stage. And Bush, in a speech delivered on the 17th of April 1989 in Michigan, said, I quote, the Cold War began in Eastern Europe and if it is to end, it will end in this crucible of world conflict, end of quote, this crucible of world conflict, Eastern Europe. And then on the 31st of May, in Mainz, West Germany, so before June, he, he evoked this image of a Europe that is whole and free and at peace with itself. By the way, I think one of the best and shortest descriptions of what we were trying to achieve, a Europe whole and free and at peace with itself. So the vision is already there before the beginning of June, but it's mightily reinforced by the 4th of June in Poland, Gorbachev in Germany, then the ceremonial reburial of Imre Nodz. And of course, Bush Sr. himself comes first to Poland, and then, as you will recall, to Hungary in July 1989, you can tell me what an impact it made he, he made here, but he, it certainly made a big impact on him. It made a huge impact on him, particularly the encounter on Kossuth Square and the response of the crowds and his great gesture of giving a raincoat to an old lady who was shivering in the rain on Kossuth Square. I don't know, some of you may remember that. Um, by the way, it turns out subsequently it wasn't his raincoat. It was one of his secret policemen's raincoat. But never mind, so he made this great gentleman gesture of giving away his secret, police, secret service man's raincoat. But it made a big impact on him. So that I think if your question, Pierre, was about the impact on the West, I think specifically the impact on American policy. With Germany, it's a much more narrowly defined story. It's about Germany pursuing its own Ostpolitik still broadly on the old lines, but in particular, it's Deutschlandpolitik. And so seeing in Poland and Hungary an opportunity for advancing freedom of movement from East Germany. And it's very interesting to read the protocols of the conversations between Miklos Nemet and Helmut Kohl. Uh, for example, in August 1989, when Germany has delivered that credit. And it's quite narrowly about the position of the East Germans and freedom of movement for East Germany. Incidentally, in the conversation with Miklos Nemet in, in Schloss Gimnich in August 1989, there's a wonderful moment uh, 
when they start talking about developments in Poland, somewhat critically. So Kohl and Nemeth are talking rather critically about these irresponsible Poles. And Nemeth at one point says, you know, uh, Chancellor, I think in the last 10 years, one has seen an alarming development in Poland towards nihilism. So Adam, if you didn't know you were a nihilist, you have it from Miklos Nemeth, as a word to describe what was happening in Poland between 1979 and 1989. I think nihilism is a very interesting word. But the German focus, as I say, was specifically, and therefore it was, the freedom of movement that they achieved. So this brings me to the point where we have a story which the historian can tell, which is not the story that is often told by conservative American historians which is essentially about the triumph of Ronald Reagan. Ronald Reagan says, Mr. Gorbachev, bring down that wall. The trumpets sound, and miraculously, the Berlin Wall comes down. It's a much more complex story in which developments in the Soviet Union, but also in Central and Eastern Europe, interreact in a complex process of emancipation in developing a new form of revolution and when the opportunity then presents itself, by the end of 1989, then we have a very impressive example of Western statecraft from three figures in particular. From George H.W. Bush, statecraft of a very high order. From Helmut Kohl, who once he sees what's happening, grasps the opportunity. And of course, from Gorbachev. And that is essential to the peaceful negotiation of the end of the Cold War, the unification of Germany. So that looking back from 2004, after the enlargement of NATO, after the first big eastward enlargement of the EU, one could indeed say that this was a triumph of the West and that Central Europe East Central Europe had become part of the West. But how does it look today in the perspective of 30 years? And here I come to the third part of what I want to say. This is a story of, as so often in history, unpredicted, unforeseen, and unintended long-term consequences of what happened in 1989, many of which are quite negative. First of all, one could, I think, argue with only slight exaggeration that the triumph of the West actually has precipitated the current crisis of the West as a geopolitical actor. Because the West as a geopolitical actor only came into existence after 1939, faced with the challenge of Adolf Hitler and the Axis powers, and survived as a geopolitical actor because of the challenge of the Soviet Union and the Soviet bloc. When the Soviet Union had and the Soviet bloc had ceased to exist, the transatlantic ties were already weakening through the 1990s. And they are even more dramatically weakening today. So that it's a really interesting question whether one can talk about the West as a serious geopolitical actor today. I doubt it, certainly in the age of Donald Trump. Incidentally, if you do a LexisNexis search of leading English language publications and put in the West, innumerable references in the 1970s, Still many, many references in the 1990s. Very few references in the 2010s. Very few people talk about the West as a geopolitical actor today. Secondly, the crisis of the West has a lot to do with the disappearance of the ideological competition posed by the Soviet bloc. Adam made a very interesting comment, which is, Imranov certainly wasn't interested in building capitalism if his government had survived in 1956. And it's an interesting counterfactual thought experiment. What if 
Nodge's government had existed and had somehow developed some model of some sort of democratic socialism but different from multi-party democracy of West European time, what that would have done to Western Europe. But what happened after 1989 was there was no more third way. Capitalism was the only game in town. Francis Fukuyama was right in his fundamental point that there was no global ideological competitor to liberal democratic capitalism in the 1990s. And the result of that was that the West became overconfident, hubristic, and overreached. Ideological competition is good. It keeps you on your toes. It keeps you honest. Konkurrenz belebt das Geschäft, as the Germans say. And we had the domestic overreach of globalized, financialized capitalism, which gave us unprecedented levels of inequality and the crisis of 2008, from still, which we still haven't recovered. And in foreign policy, the overreach in particular of Iraq, which was very much informed by the image at the back of neoconservatives' heads that if, of what had happened in Eastern Europe in 1989, that if you only remove the dictatorship, then somehow automatically you would quite easily be able to build a liberal democracy. The, e the European Union developed very strongly but also some of its own crises that we see today have their origins in the aftermath of 1989. In particular, 1989 is also the effective birth year of the euro. And of course, the very flawed euro zone we have today is a source of enormous north-south tensions in the European Union. It's no accident that the best populist result outside Central and Eastern Europe in the last European elections was in Italy. Salvini's election result, 34%. It's no accident because Italy is one of the South European countries which has suffered most from being in the Eurozone and the unresolved issues of the Eurozone. But closer to home here, we also have the problems that we all know in Poland, to a lesser degree in the Czech Republic and Slovakia, and of course most of all in Hungary, and Hungary really stands out in this respect. Now, I'm not going to talk at great length about how I see developments in Hungary today, because you all know this better than me. It has its own complex etiology, its own complex set of causes. But let me just say with my weeping eye, rather than my laughing eye, that it seems to me very hard to argue that Hungary today is a democracy. It's certainly not a liberal democracy. And a liberal democracy, strictly speaking, is a contradiction in terms. Lesha Kwiatkowski said that democratic communism is like fried snowballs. Well, strictly speaking, uh, illiberal democracy is like fried snowballs, but I think it's a useful term of art to describe a decaying democracy, one that is increasingly illiberal, that doesn't respect minority rights, increasingly doesn't respect the rule of law, that is not yet uh, uh, a fully authoritarian regime. I have to say, subject to correction by present company, that I think that is the case in Poland. I think Poland is somewhere on that scale, somewhere in that transitional state of a liberal democracy, my own view is that Hungary is beyond that, that a difference in quantity has become a difference in quality, and that there's now some form of hybrid authoritarian regime. Political scientists could argue about the exact term. It is the only member state of the European Union which Freedom House classifies as partly free. 64th on the Transparency International Corruption Index, 87th on the World Press Freedom Index. In 2010, it was 23rd. Um, a country in which increasingly the pillars of a liberal democracy, of a pluralist and open society are being demolished. 
including, and I mentioned this at the beginning, independent scholarship and the pursuit of historical truth. In the removal of the statue of Imre Nord, in the attack on the 1956 Institute, in the attack on this very institution in which we're speaking, the Hungarian Academy of Sciences, we see an attack on independent scholarship and the pursuit of historical truth, which is an essential part of a free country. I, a week ago today, was at an event in Bratislava where the current Hungarian foreign minister was speaking. And it was very interesting because it made me feel almost as if I was back in the late 1980s. That is to say, the way in which he defended the behavior of the Hungarian government in relation to the 1956 Institute and the Hungarian Academy of Sciences in particular was the kind of um, mendacity that I recall vividly from the late Kadar years. It's what I would call late Kadarist Jesuitical bullshit, using the term bullshit in the technical philosophical sense introduced into academic discourse by Professor Harry Frankfurter. That is to say, you don't, it's not the outright totalitarian big lie, it's a little collage of half-truths. So he said, for example, see, you, they are not forced to leave um, because there's somewhere I've never heard of called McDaniel College which is perfectly free to issue American university degrees here. And therefore, um, the, the law is being applied with complete even-handedness, you understand. Uh, and it's quite normal for the state to decide how state funding for academic research should be instituted. In other words, this little collage of half-truths, um, which together go to make uh, the, the big lie. Um, but it is deeply, deeply distressing to me personally, having witnessed the emancipation of Central Europe through the 1980s, having celebrated the triumph of freedom and democracy in 1989, and the transition to the West in the next 15 years to see what is happening here. Um, I'm currently now working on a postscript to my book about 1989, which will explore this. But I don't want to dwell so much on the situation in Hungary, but just as my last couple of observations to come back to what you asked me to ask, talk about, which is what it tells us about the West. Because you can tell me more specifically what it tells us about the domestic development in Hungary, but in a way, equally shocking, if not more shocking, is what it tells us about the West in general and the European Union in particular. And let me just mention two points. When people looked to the European magnet, to Europe in the 1980s, they saw the European community as a combination of values and money, right? So it was prosperity, it was money, but it was also a set of values, respect for human rights, minority rights, freedom of speech, expression, scholarship, uh, free and fair elections, and so forth. And those two things were seen to go together. And actually, I think one can argue that in the accession process between 1989 and 2014, by and large, they did. Because as we all know who've studied these things, the normative power of the European Union is at its greatest when a country is aspiring to join the European Union. Indeed, it's at its absolute maximum about a month before you join the European Union. What we, and by the way, let me just say that this attitude of the European Union towards the new democracies of East Central Europe was not without its own double standards. Because an ideal standard was applied to the new democracies of East Central Europe, not to existing member states, 
for example, Silvio Berlusconi's Italy, when he was prime minister, would not, in my view, have met the Co Copenhagen criteria, for example, for media pluralism, to become a member of the European Union, but it was in, so that was fine. Now, what we discovered is that's all very fine until the moment a country is admitted to the European Union. Once you're inside, you can do whatever you bloody well like. The normative power of the European Union disappears almost entirely the moment you're inside. What is more shocking, not only does the normative power disappear, but you go on getting the money. So one of the most shocking act, uh, aspects of what Viktor Orban has been able to do in the name of the, her the heritage of 1989 is that he has been able to erode, if not dismantle, liberal democracy in Hungary while receiving 3 billion euros a year from the European mm -hmm. Union, 2.5% of GDP, the largest sum per capita of EU structural funds. Um, in other words, it's not just he's gone on receiving the money and been eroding liberal democracy. It's more than that. The money has itself been one of the instruments through the use of which, in rewarding various oligarchs and cronies and parts of the system, and using it for patronage, he has actually dismantled the system. So, some of you will know that, and I, I can hardly bear to say this, my own country, Britain, it looks as if it's about to get Boris Johnson as Prime Minister. If you think it's bad here, imagine having Boris Johnson as Prime Minister. Now, Boris Johnson has a famous phrase, which is, his attitude to cake is, you should have your cake and eat it. This is called cakeism in English, the ideology of cakeism. The truth is that Boris Johnson, as a Brexit Prime Minister, will neither have his cake nor eat it. The person who is having his cake and eating it, who is practicing cakeism, is Viktor Orban. He is a man who is biting the hand that is feeding him, campaigning with vast posters saying, stop Brussels against Jean-Claude Juncker while receiving the money. So that the first thing, the first problem we have to confront out of this is to try to connect the Europe of values and the Europe of money. This is actually an old problem of the history of European integration because the Europe of values historically was in the Council of Europe and the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe and it was a European economic community and it was primarily an economic community and so to speak, the values and democratic standards have been reverse engineered into the architecture of the European Union, right? But they haven't actually been linked to the money. And that is the challenge we face in the next episode of the history of the European Union, to reconnect the values and the money. So it's something that Hungary has shown us about the European Union, but also a challenge that Hungary faces the European Union. The other thing, which will be familiar to all of you, but let me just put it in maybe a slightly unfamiliar light, is the fact that the European Union is in some way a democratic union, not just a union of democracies, but itself has democratic institutions, n n namely, notably, the European Parliament. That fact has also facilitated the erosion of liberal democracy in Hungary. Because one of the main reasons why the EU has been so weak in imposing conditionality on Hungary in respect of violations of the rule of law and other violations of the European treaties is, as you all know, that Fidesz continues astonishingly to be a member of the European People's Party, the main center-right grouping. And to this day, Manfred Weber, who hopes, I think in vain, by the way, I, but who hopes this week to be appointed president of the European Commission, mm -hmm. 
Manfred Weber is counting the 13 votes of the Fidesz MEPs in the European Parliament as part of his majority in the European Parliament, even though Fidesz is notionally suspended from the EPP. Now, that is, in my view, a scandal, simply a scandal. It is a scandal that Fidesz is still a member of the EPP. It's really quite shocking, given that the EPP has European values at the heart of its charter. But beyond that, it tells you something really quite interesting about the working of the European Union, which is to say it is precisely that part of the European Union architecture which was intended to address the democratic deficit of the European Union, namely the European Parliament, the party groupings like the EPP and the Spitzenkandidaten. It's precisely that attempt to make European democracy which has made the EU so ineffective in combating the erosion of democracy in Hungary today. So what was meant to increase, increase democracy has in fact facilitated the erosion of democracy. With that, I come to an end. The ceremonial reburial of Imre Nodge on the 16th of June 1989 was and remains a great moment, the victory of a defeat, one in a chain of events which pr produced the end of communism in Central and Eastern Europe, ultimately the end of the Soviet Union, the end of the Cold War, the end of the division of Europe. But just as so often in history, the seeds of victory, of that victory in 1989, were sown in the moment of defeat in 1956. So as so often, the seeds, I'm not going to say of defeat, because we're not yet defeated, but the seeds of the crisis that we have today were to a significant degree sown in the triumph of the West and then the hubristic overreach of the West 30 years ago. I'm not going to say that we now have to do with the defeat of a victory, because that would be defeatism and fatalism. I'm not going to say that. A luta continua, I'm convinced that we can still win, but we have once again a great battle on our hands, as we did in early 1989. Thank you all very much.